The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. But pray that your flight not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now it says, those days shall be shortened. What days? It says, for then, for at this specific time, there will be great tribulation and great trouble. The worst there's ever been on planet Earth. To keep this in context, this is depicting a, uh, depicting a time during massive tribulation, great troubles. In fact, this time of tribulation is when those in Judea are told to go flee to the mountains. When the abomination of desolation is set up, that's going to be the great tribulation. According to the context of the Bible, God gives us a location for that. And that is in Jerusalem, right? the great tribulation. He said there will be great tribulation. Somehow, people get this term great tribulation and they apply it to everything. But unfortunately, that's not what's in the Bible all over the place. Just as sure as it was the Jews who were burned, right? They were bald, not everybody else. Do you see that? He says, Matthew 24, 15, And you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. That means don't go back to get your good stuff, your important things. Just leave. And he, said, he says, Neither let him which is in the field return back to take any of his clothes as an abandonment of all material things. And woe unto them that are with child, and them, them that give suck in those days, those with babies. For pray ye that your flight not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why not on the Sabbath? Now this is curious. I'm going to give you guys my, this is my personal insight. Why would Jesus say, but pray that your flight not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day? Well, here it is. You ready for this? This is something I understood from the beginning. I never really shared this. I, I think I shared it a couple of times. But I don't really share these things because it takes a lot of context. And I don't like to get into uh, arguments or anything like that. But if the abomination is, is set up in the holy place and somebody has taken over Jerusalem, right? Somebody has also erected a type of odd worship there. We know that's the bees from the book of Daniel. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall place the abomination that make it desolate there. That was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. A force coming into Jerusalem, taking it over. And by war, they just, they just totally obliterate the whole place. But they set up a figure there, a god. They set up a god there. Some, uh, they set up a, a strong point. So when everybody sees this, that's the ultimate desecration of God's holy land. And when he said, when you see this, then flee. Why? Because he's not going to stop them from coming into Jerusalem. They're going to trample it underfoot 40 in two months. And if they do this, Jerusalem is going to be totally taken over. And those people there, if they're caught there, God has already given his decree. Why? Because that was declared in the book of Jeremiah as part of God's indignation for what they did in the book of Jeremiah. And his indignation is the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot for him. Too much why? Because he called them the daughter of Babylon. And he's going to purge his vineyard, Isaiah 5. He's going to purge that vineyard, his own vineyard that he loves. Above all things, he's going to purge it. When this time hits, he's not going to favor anybody in this if they're caught in that place. He already gave them their fate. He already spoke. It's in prophecy. He's not going to adjust it. He said, no, would he repent of it? That's why he told them which be in Judea, flee into the mountains. He said, run, because I'm not going to withdraw this sentence upon you. Run. He's going to allow these people to come in there and totally obliterate anybody who's in that place. So he says, run. And he says, woe unto them that were charmed, to them they give suck in those days, but pray that your flight not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath. Why? Because if they set up worship of a God whose, whose fathers, right, nobody knew, a strange God, will he magnify and increase with glory, with gold and silver and all this stuff? He's going to do that in Jerusalem, which means the Sabbath day is going to be some sort of a weird holy day. And if they get caught doing anything on the Sabbath day, that's going to be instant death. He won't permit worship of the Most High in that place anymore. 
and they worship on the Sabbath. So if they start to, if they get caught on the Sabbath, they're bound by their faith to give thanks to God, to worship, to keep that day holy. But if that happens in sight of the beast who's now in that place, they're going to die. So he says, run. When they see this set up, he says, run. And he says, and except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Now, also Matthew 24, 21 says that these are the days that a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to that time, no nor ever shall be. And in the book of Daniel 11 and 12, it talks about these days being the worst that there were. And he says, for the elect's sake. He says, if God didn't cut time short, what time? That time the time of this siege, the time of this trouble, the time of the setting up of the abomination of desolation. If he didn't set that time, cut that time short, no flesh would have been saved. That means no life would have been found there. That means nobody would have been found. But he says, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And those days implies the days of what? Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. He'll cut those days short. Why? Because he abruptly ends the siege in 42 months. Power is taken away from the beast to have his dominion in that area. That's clear in the book of Joel. All of it goes together. That's clear in the book of Joel. But he cuts that time short, meaning the time that the beast desired to rule in that place. God says no more. God has a time limit on it. When he evokes that time limit, when he enacts that time limit, that's it. Then God makes the difference because once his indignation is fulfilled, once his prophecy that he personally put upon his own people, once that is fulfilled in that place, that's the end of that. Now, you have to continue to read so you can have all of this in context. This will not happen all over the world. I don't believe that. I don't believe this is going to happen all over the world. Because at that same time, people are going to be uh, um, praying between the porch and the altar. It was said to call a solemn assembly. Let's continue. And it says, then at that time, when this happens, if there be any, if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. You see that? That's after this time of massive and great trouble. And he goes on to say, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So during that time, right after this great troublesome time, God puts an end to it before the beast thinks he's done. He puts an end to it. He says, behold, I've told you before. Now, right after this trouble, why would there be a caution right after this trouble to not go after false Christs? Because it will be a time, a hopeless time, as explained in the book of Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, right? It'll be a hopeless time. It'll be a time where God's people have taken the grunt of the blow from the beast. And then that's when saviors normally pop up saying, ah, here I am. I'm the one who ended the trouble. Or it was my prayer that ended the trouble. But in, well, we know the truth, that God put a time limit on it. And you'll still have false ones rising up, which means there's a devilish and devil's influences in this place, all around this place, ready to deceive people. Just because the reign of the beast at this specific time ends in that place does not mean that evil is all around. So God will cut that time short according to who? To whomever is going through that. So time is not, time is not, it's not like the whole world is going to experience a shortening of time that way. God will cut the time short. When God cuts time short, he doesn't do so for himself. He does so for us. When you're in trouble like that, time stops. When you're in an unfavorable condition, time lingers, doesn't it? It seems like it goes on forever so long as the trouble goes on forever. God will cut time that time short. He specifically said that time, not, not all time, but that time short. I'll read it again. He says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to that time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What days? The days of the siege of Jerusalem. And if you want to know about those days, all you have to do is flip to Daniel 11. Now, but, but before you go any further, it's important that you have this in context. So the rest of this has to be read, right? You just, you can't stop there and say, I got the whole picture. It won't work that way. You have to know the rest of it because the rest of the world, the rest of the saints are in the rest of it. Those who are uh, watching this, because it's very clear in scripture, people will see this from afar. 
They're not going to be touched by it. They will see it from afar. Some of the same people will fight against the beast. So everybody at this time is not some evil, you know, overtaken individual. That's not what will happen. He's going to cut that short. Anyway, so if this siege, if we look at Daniel 11, let's look. I'll show you something right here real quick. Daniel 11 says the exact same thing as what I said here in Matthew 20, uh, 4, 15 through 24, 28. So let's go to Daniel 11. Let me read this for you real quick. He's talking about these. He's talking about the entry of the beast into Jerusalem, and here's how it starts. At the time appointed, shall I return and come down toward the south? This is Daniel eleven twenty nine. Shall I come down to the south? But it shall not be as the former or the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Intelligence means they have co-opted a plan to go into something like what they're doing right now. In closed channels, if you don't think there is a plan to take Jerusalem right now, you're, you're just sadly mistaken. If you think that's years off, you're sadly mistaken. And arms shall stand on his part. Arms, in this case, are armies. They'll stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, those that don't like the holy covenant, but that land is given to God's people, those who don't like that holy covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. He's going to recruit even more. But the people that do know their God shall be strong to exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, and by captivity, and by spoil many days. Do you hear that? That has been context too, yes. Those that know their God will be strong to exploits, but they're going to fall by the sword. That means they're going to be killed. And by flame, burnt up. And by captivity, taken as prisoners. And by spoil, captured and traded off for things. Many days, he says. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with little help. Hope, that word hoping means help. With little help. And it explains how people are going to help them. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. That's when somebody comes to somebody else who is in prison. Their land is decimated. And they say, well, just hang in there. We're going to do something one day. That's when they have a meeting at the UN and say, well, we've got to do something about this. Kind of like the Ukraine. All those people dying over there, right? In the Ukraine, the innocent folks dying in the Ukraine. Some of the innocent Russians dying. And people are saying, well, we've got to put our heads together. So that, you know, the innocent people, they won't die. But they're dying every single day. They're just talking. Yep, yep, yep. They're doing nothing about it. In fact, they're promoting more war. That's when you cleave or, or that's when you embrace someone with flatteries. By speech, you're giving them false hopes. You're telling them exactly what they want to hear. That's what a flatter is. When you flatter someone, that's what you do. So it sounds like politics. But they shall cleave to them with flatteries. But now take note, many are going to die. Many are going to be burned up. They're going to die by the sword. Now God is doing this. Now listen to what he says. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them understanding shall fall. They shall fall. Some of them understanding shall fall. Those are the ones who know who Christ is. They're still going to fall to try them, to purge, and to make them white even to the time of the end. But it is yet for an appointed time. There we are. That appointed time. That's time. That's that time being cut short. The time that people thought they had that the beast thought he had. It's going to come to an abrupt end before he's even ready. Because he was caught by surprise in the book of Revelation. When his kingdom was thrust into darkness. Let's continue to read. So, and some of them understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for an appointed time. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper. Listen, this is the most important part. And he will prosper. He will do exactly what he wants to do until the indignation be accomplished. That indignation to be accomplished is God's indignation. God is the one allowing the beast to get away with this in the first place. If God had no indignation, this would never happen. You have to understand that. It's because of God's indignation this happens in the first place. And it's not going to happen all over the world because God said it won't. He said it's going to happen in this place. For that that is determined shall be done. That's our Father's statement. For that that is determined shall be done. You see that? This is something God decreed in the book of Jeremiah. Something he said he would not repent of. Something he said he won't be satisfied until this happens. Now listen, this thing 
Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of a woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So if he's not going to regard the God of his fathers, or, or any God, then it's not Allah, is it? It's not Allah. It's not anything we know of. It's a brand new one. And a brand new one is what they talk about now is what you are being steered toward now. It's why I can't stand that term, trust the science. I know what that is. I've heard the back talk on that, and they're actually doing it. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. You see that. And at the time of the end, the king of the south, now this goes, others out of other kingdoms go against this guy. There's a squabble, and then others go against this guy. They go against him. Now listen to what it says in chapter 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Remember, this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. There it is. That's our father cutting all that time short. Do you see that? There's going to be a time of trouble, but then all of a sudden, right? Do you also know what this is? Do you guys know what this is? Anybody know what this is? This is when the mystery of God is finished. This is the last trump. I hope you know that. Oh boy, it gives us such context here. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The dead shall rise first. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting uh, shame and contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That wise means those who have the wisdom of the God of, of God's word. Those who taught only the wise teach. So they're gonna they're gonna shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's a physical change. They're gonna go through a change in the twinkling of an eye. They're gonna go through a change. And they that turn many to righteousness, they're gonna shine as the stars forever and ever. This will be before all who live at that time. Before all, they're gonna change in a twinkling of an eye, a brand new form. This is it. This is the time everybody waits for. Unfortunately, Daniel is left off when people start talking about this time. But it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and set up the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and all shall be increased. This is that time in context. Matthew 24, Daniel 11 and 12 talk about the exact same thing. Time being cut short, it's God's interruption of the whole thing. Remember, no one knows when the sun is sent, but we know that this is going to happen on the seventh trump. But no one knows, no one can tell anybody when Jesus is coming back. He comes at a time his enemies know not, that even we know not, only the Father knows. But we know that the Father at the last trump sends him, and the mystery of God is finished according to the book of Revelation. Those who are, are alive at that time, they will experience this. But as we have just read, many won't be alive at that time. Do you see that? Now, Enoch talks about the elect. For the elect's sake, the elect are clearly those who trust in the one that was hidden this entire time, the one that was to come, the Messiah. Those who believe in the Messiah, everything will be for their sakes, those who believe. Remember when Jesus said, you believe because you see, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. You're the ones, the ones who struggle. You didn't see anything. You're in this world. You didn't see proof of anything. You have not walked with Christ. So you can only believe by faith. You don't have your proof. You can only believe by faith. You can only pray by faith. Don't you know that all you've been doing in sincerity for the Lord has been by faith? Because you can't do it any other way. That means you've been doing it for real. That's why you have to be careful of Satan's tongue. That would weaken you. The tongue that says, well, you're just, you know, you're not going to make it unless you do it this way. Stop listening to him because you're doing everything by faith. You're reading a book, but you're believing by way of your soul and heart. God put that in you. That's your seal. You see that? So everything is fulfilled. Angel says, I think it's one of the corruptible is raised. That's right. That's exactly. See, right here, Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see that? Well, there we are. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, this part is often not well. it's spoken about. It's just not emphasized in this popular narrative that people speak by. They leave that part off. It's in the New Testament. It's just not spoken of. Not spoken of at all. That people will be raised from the dead, but some will not go with the Lord. Some are going to be condemned. That is a specific type of person. The other ones will be raised. To be raised and to go with the Lord is to be raised incorruptible. That's why they shine with the brightness of the firmament of the stars. When you guys see 
a dangerous constellation you're about to see in the heavens. No one will miss it. They will explain it to you guys as something else. I'm telling you right now, it's a constellation of doom. This constellation has only come four times. Don't ask me how I know about it. Don't ask me why this is not aligning with everybody else's say so. I'm telling you right now, you're going to see a brand new constellation. That means more than one light in the sky. That's going to be a constellation of absolute 100% judgment. When you see that constellation, make sure your house is in order. There'll be no playtime from that time forward. And whatever you've gotten away with prior to that time, you better believe you're going to be watched and scrutinized. That's also going to be the time when many begin to die of strange occurrences. You will witness many strange things. And all the while, this constellation will be a witness. It will grow in the heavens, only to a point, and it won't move. And while everybody else is living their life in the world, prospering in everything they can prosper, in, compromising for the sake of more money, keep yourselves clean of greed, of betrayal. Don't dwell on those who have gone against you. Remember, when you face the Lord, it will be about what you did to everybody else, not what everybody else did to you. Let the Lord be your avenger. Take no vengeance yourselves. These days are close, and they will not be fun for anybody. These days require absolute sobriety. Let the Lord instruct you. If you feel that calling of sincerity upon your spirit even now, if you feel that there's a that there's a seriousness to your studying in the Word of God right now, there's a reason for that. I would say that just about everybody who believes in Christ, they feel that call to sincerity. They feel that things are not a game anymore. The things you used to get away with a long time ago, you dare not do those things today. It feels dangerous today to play with anything, doesn't it? And how many of us have slipped off on an exit only to get quickly back on that straight and narrow again? Because we say to ourselves, I, I can't do this. Something serious is for me. Where is it? Most people are spending their days waking up trying to find out what in the world it is. What is it? They're on the internet and everywhere else. They're trying to see who's going to speak it. They have not identified it yet, but they know something is growing. Something is forming. Something is coming. And whatever it is, it's unlike anything else. Popular narrative. It's not going to do in these days. People are starting to really starting to look for meat. Many have had enough milk. Many are actually searching out the truth no matter what the consequences are. And that's very promising. Because that's an actual marker of the last days that God gave us in the Old Testament. The change in the saints is the timepiece of all things. Well, now you know. And it's strange that out of all the people that were elect, Enoch spoke of it most. He spoke of the elect all the time. He identified them. He told them not to worry. He understood their sufferings, what they had been drawn into. But he also said in their heart of hearts, they did believe. Many were beguiled. Do you not know that it said both in the Bible and Enoch, your days of beguilement will soon be over. The days where you are led astray will soon be over. And that is beautiful. That's an acknowledgement that yes, you have been led astray, but that won't happen again. You're going to be bought home. That is beautiful because the Lord will break us from any and all things that we once carried. I'm going to read this. And I saw there a host of angels at punishment going. And they held scourges of chains and iron and bronze. And I asked the angel of peace, who went with me, saying, To whom are these who hold the scourges going? And he said unto me, To their elect and beloved ones, that they may be cast into the chasm of the abyss and valley. Now listen, this word elect and loved ones means their favorite people and the ones they love. Now he's talking about the fallen angels. I'm going to read this again. And I saw there a host of the angels of punishment going. The angels of punishment began to move and they held scourges and chains of iron and bronze. And I asked the angel of peace who went with me saying, to whom are these who hold the scourges going? And he said unto me, to their elect and beloved ones, to the ones they loved, to their favorite ones, that they may be cast into a chasm of the abyss and valley. That's an angel exacting the punishment to an angel. And then that valley shall be filled with their elect and beloved. And listen, these are angels, angels of punishment, who were, who were once friends, family, with the ones who fell, going to the ones who fell to imprison them. How sad is that? And then the valley shall be filled with their elect and beloved, and the days of their lives shall be at an end. 
that's going to be the end of them. And the days of their leading astray shall not be thenceforward be reckoned. And in those days, the angels shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. You live in those days, by the way. They shall stir up kings, so that the spirit of unrest shall come upon them, and they shall rouse them from their thrones, that they may break forth as lions from their lairs, and as hungry wolves among their flocks. And they shall go up and tread underfoot the lands of his elect ones, and the land of his elect ones shall be before them a threshing floor. He's talking about Jerusalem. And the land of his elect, not the devil's elect, but God's elect, and the land of his elect ones shall be before them a threshing floor and a highway. So in the Middle East, angels are hurled toward the Middle East. They rouse up the kings. These kings, these people who are ruling, they have a change of heart and mind, and they finally assault Israel, specifically Jerusalem, just what we were reading about. All of this goes together, by the way. And the land of his elect one, elect one shall be before them a threshing floor and a highway. But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses. The city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses. And they shall begin to fight amongst themselves. And the right hand shall be strong against themselves. Listen, their right hand shall be strong against themselves. They're going to start fighting amongst themselves. And a man shall not know his brother, nor a son his father or his mother, till there be no number of corpses through their slaughter, and their punishment be not in vain. In those days Sheol shall open its jaws, and they shall be swallowed up therein, and their destruction shall be at an end. Sheol shall devour the sinners in the presence of the elect. This is when God intercedes. The siege of, of Israel is over, and all of a sudden God delivers his people. But those people who are not delivered go into everlasting shame, into bondage, into everything. We just read that in Daniel 12. It's the same thing told a thousand different ways. When they attack Jerusalem and that city is under siege, God intervenes this time. Remember in Joel when he said, I'll look down upon my land and pity the people. Remember that's when he intercedes. That's when he intercedes. And he cuts all of it short for the elect's sake. That's when his vineyard is thoroughly purged. So what is everybody else going to be doing in this time? I can tell you right now, just as many were bystanders in the great wars of old, so will many bystanders be now. But listen to me, in your patience possess your souls because America and Europe and all these Western places, they're dropping the morality. Their center focus is not Christ. And we too must go through a purging. Remember, Jerusalem has no ally. No one can step foot in Jerusalem so long as the USA exists, which tells you what? The USA is going to be bound up, tied up within itself. You can see the formation of that happening now. When America's hands are fighting each other, the beast will take full advantage. In the Bible, the ally of Israel is no more. Do you know that? And who is the ally of Israel? We are. In order for America to change, we're going to have to remember what morals are. All these new ways and new ideologies that have come in this land as a result of people being idle. Too much time and freedom and wealth being spoiled to the max. All of it has to be undone. America has to be acquainted with suffering again. America has to be acquainted with how rare and precious their neighbor actually is again. America is going to have to lose many things before they realize it was God in the first place that afforded them the opportunity to do what they did. And until they acknowledge them again, the trouble will not be over here. But they will acknowledge it, as God says, all lands will. And after that happens, this siege in Jerusalem will be over. It's kind of like our lives, how we start out saying yes to the Lord. And we're often led astray through many lures of the world, only to find out we should have stayed put. So we come back like prodigal sons, with a repentant heart, understanding what we did. See, it's very difficult to tell anybody they're doing wrong when their heart is full of thrills and everything else. But when everything comes crashing down and they feel the sting of their own iniquity, that's when they finally turn and say, I've messed up. Things must not go good. All this must come crashing down. And then people will realize they've messed up and they have drifted. And then people will return. Only then will people return. It is the story of the prodigal son. So long as he had wealth, so long as he was doing good, so long as his health held up, he was doing whatever he could do. But when it all ran out, when he began to starve, when his body began to hurt, when he found out things did not come easily, 
he began to look and reflect upon his life and say, look what my deeds got me. And he began to understand his ways. And when he sat there in total defeat, he said, I have no other choice but to go back to the beginning. And with his head hung low, he went back home, just simply hoping, begging for anything to sustain him. But instead of any chastisement, there was an embrace because he came back. This is what America must do. Because in truth, these countries of wealth have lost themselves. They have drifted far from their beginnings. They don't know what suffering is when that happens. Because we have to go through it. That's when we become a nation again. That's when a value system comes back. And then oddly enough, in the Bible it mentions a new alliance that forms against the beast. That will overcome the beast through God's strong arm. These nations that were once enemies during the time of the takedown of the beast, they won't be enemies, but will join themselves. But they will be split until that time comes. So ready yourself. This is why my personal opinion, a person who would say, well, I'm not going to be here when the bad stuff happens, they're deceiving themselves. Their whole life has been that way. And every day they keep saying the same thing, deceiving themselves. All they need to do is look at their lives and there'll be no need for further sufferings. All they need to do is be obedient. There'll be no need for correction. But so long as we think we have the answer and that our path is going to be established and that does not align with the path of the living God, we're going to have that type of correction. We're going to have it, and we're going to know it, and the cost is going to be great. And that is soon to begin. That's not far off. That's not even years off. You could say right now, effectively, certain things have been delayed or being held back by sweat, blood, and tears. Right now, people are dying, so you don't have to die, but they're not going to win out. I can tell you that right now. The efforts are failing, and so everything begins fairly quickly. Remember something. So long as America is America, no one can assault Jerusalem. What we know by prophecy those days must end. Something happened to America. Something happened to Europe. Something happened to the UK. Western alliances broke down. They were weakened. Big time. Other powers took over suppressing. And we learn our lesson and are abased. Abased enough to go back to the living God and say forgive us. Let us learn of you Lord now. So something heavy is coming. Get yourselves ready. Always be ready. It doesn't even necessarily. You, you don't have to pinpoint everything that's going to happen. Be ready for the Lord's truth to take effect. Prepare your souls that you're not weak in any area. There are areas of our lives. We know our own weaknesses. But have we been working to strengthen those areas we're weak in? Are we spending time looking at the corners of our ceilings or in his word, trying to discover who God is and what he actually wants of each of us? Or are we trying to market everything we find for the sake of men's admiration? 